Alrighty. Well, lesson three, we're going to talk about how the local church fulfills the Great Commission. Um, so last week we defined what the mission was. And we lingered primarily on the fact that the church, um, that, that the Great Commission is planting churches and planting churches in all the people groups of the world. So we kind of lingered on that. Um, and so when we defined mission as not just everything a Christian can do that obeys Jesus, but we talked about specifically the task that Jesus Christ has sent his church into the world um, to accomplish. Um, just a reminder of uh, the definition of the mission of the church that we gave last week from Greg Gilbert and Kevin DeYoung. We said the mission of the church is to go into the world and make disciples by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit and gathering these disciples into churches that they might worship the Lord and obey his commands now and in eternity to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> so last week was the what, and this week is the how. Um, and I do want to just clarify something. Last week I talked a lot about the mission of the church, the church, the church. I just want to talk about really quick what I meant by that. Um, when, you know, when we're talking about the Great Commission and how the church goes global and finishes the Great Commission, we're not just talking about individual Christians. Um, it's easy for us uh, to, to, to read it through that lens. Yes, we all play an individual part, but when we're talking about the mission of the church, we're primarily talking about local churches. And um, so when you're, when you're hearing us talking about the how, well, just think on an individual level, although it will take all individual Christians playing their part, but we're talking about how God wants local churches to function, uh, what the scriptures give to where, how, do, how the church is going to see this happen. Um, and so this is on a local level, but also on at a universal level, it's going to take, it's been said, I think it was um, John Stott who said it's, it'll take the whole church to bring a whole Christ to the whole world. Um, so we'll see that this is going to take a universal effort on behalf of the church, but it's coming from a local church perspective. Okay. So, I think I got 11 ways, <clears throat> 11 ways that the church fulfills the Great Commission. We're going to start with that. So how does the local church fulfill the Great Commission? Um, one is by prayer. Do I have the verse up here? Yes. So this, this, this topic of, of prayer will probably have a whole lecture to itself, but we'll be brief right here. Um, there are numerous ways the church is to pray in order to see the Great Commission fulfilled. Um, firstly, where they pray for the Spirit's power for Christian witness. Acts 1.8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Um, so Jesus ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit and calls us to do the same thing. It's pretty interesting that the disciples had even a, um, a physical encounter with the resurrected Jesus, and yet that wasn't enough. So you see me, you, may, you think, man, my, I'm, too, I'm too much of a coward. My faith is, I just had stronger faith, or I don't know. Maybe I would be a more effective witness, right? But Jesus says you need, this is such an impossible thing that only God can do it through you. And we saw that the mission of God, the church is the instrument that God uses to fulfill his mission. And so God is more than willing to give the, the power that the church needs to do this work. Um, so whatever God calls us to do in the Christian life, um, or whether it be at a local level with our corporate ministry, whether it be giving, loving, preaching, or serving, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do it all. I mean, really. I mean, Jesus said, apart from me, you want to be fruitful? Abide in me. Let my word abide in you. Uh, come to me and ask, and it will be given to you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So God has made us um, to not be 
sufficient in ourselves, but to be completely insufficient, but to find our sufficiency in Him. And if the church is going to have powerful or fruitful ministry, that's why. That's, we need to, to take God's commands to seek Him in prayer for power and for the Holy Spirit's power. Um, there's a big difference between the church trying to, I think it was a, um, a Chinaman, don't quote me on this, <clears throat> came to America and said, wow, it's amazing all the stuff you guys can do without prayer. You know, and so you see really, you know, we get, the American church, we get a lot of things right, a lot of things wrong. But I think of one of the things that we get wrong is, yes, especially in Reformed churches, heavy influence on the Word, and that's wonderful. But not a lot of power in prayer. You know, um, people think about Charles Spurgeon and his church and his ministry. People, you know, a lot of historians will say he could very much be the best preacher in, in church history. Um, I mean, it's amazing the, the people who would get saved. Me and my wife were talking um, about him the other day, and she was telling me a story. He even went to a place to test the acoustics and shouted, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And he shouted it in the auditorium, and a man heard him say that and ended up getting saved. I mean, in the ways his writings went around the world. But and we think that, man, he was just really gifted. He was really clever. He was really smart. He was really godly, but he would always accredit the power um, to his preaching to the 800 people who would come and pray every Sunday morning for corporate prayer. And so the church, his church, the prayers of the saints are what advanced the gospel through his preaching. See how it's a body thing, right? We all have different gifts, right? But when people pray, things happen, right? And, and, God, because it's a body. I mean, think about it, brother. Think about the fact that, yeah, you may never preach a day in your life, but your prayers for the advancement of the gospel and for the power of witness, it's amazing what God can do. And who's going to get to heaven and, and see who gets the, I don't want to say you're going to get all the credit for that, but you're going to share in that. Um, and that's the way God has designed the body. Um, so what else did they pray? What else do we pray for? We were to pray for boldness to preach the gospel, right? So this text in Acts 4, this is after the Holy Spirit has already came, right? Peter, I was just reading about how, you know, Peter had his, he, his self-reliance. You know, he, it's like, sometimes it's like our strongest um, characteristics are also our weakest, where, you know, Peter was asking to come out on the boat to Jesus and walk on the water, you know, and he had little faith, and we was like, oh, he looked at the waves. But what about the other disciples who didn't even attempt that, you know? Um, so there was a lot of great strength from Peter, but one of his things was, was self-reliance. I'll never deny you. I'll never deny you, right? And, and Jesus says, Satan demanded to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And what happens? An hour of temptation comes, Right? What are they doing? They're sleeping when they should be praying. Christ come is betrayed. Um, the sheep scatter like the like the prophets tell us what happened. And Peter denies Christ before a little girl. Right? Um, but then the Spirit of God comes in power at Pentecost and he stands up before thousands and preaches. Right? But that doesn't end there. Right? Acts chapter 4. What are they doing? It says, and it says, and now, Lord, this is their prayer for continued boldness to preach the gospel. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Right? So this is not just something that you pray once for the church to fulfill this great commission. We need to have a, a demeanor that's always looking outward and saying, give me boldness. Give me boldness. I'm sorry, guys. I am a coward when it comes to sharing my faith. God has blessed me to, to be able to share the gospel with many people on the streets and, and in my, many different ways, but it's all because of him every time. If you could be in my mind with what goes through my mind, <laughs> it's definitely, this, this prayer is definitely true. And um, so if the church is going to fulfill the Great Commission, they need to constantly be praying for boldness. Um, what else? Churches to pray for God's kingdom to come. I wish we really had time 
to spend a whole lecture on this. Jesus says, pray like this. This is supposed to be a daily model prayer. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is a massive request. Massive request. Who's he saying to pray for? The whole earth. That the kingdom of God, the purpose for which God created the world, that redemptive history would be completed on earth as it is in heaven. That God would receive the glory and the praise and for the advancement of his kingdom on earth. And he's saying this is a daily prayer. And later on in the, in the studies, what we'll see is we'll look at history with saints who took this prayer serious. And it is amazing the results that are still happening hundreds of years afterwards because of a few people's prayers. Right? So the church advances the gospel by praying for God's kingdom to come. This is a huge prayer. Again, I feel bad that we're spending so little time right now on it. What else are we to pray for? We're going to see the Great Commission finished. We're to pray for, for more laborers. He said unto them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So what is, what is the church to do? How does the church do this? By simply just saying, God, will you please raise up laborers? Will you please do this? It's interesting, each time in Scripture where Jesus says this, he says this a couple times in the Gospel, it always results with people being sent. Right? So when Jesus says this, um, what one instance, the, pot, the twelve are sent out two by two. Right? And then another instance, 72 are sent. What if every time you prayed for God to send up laborers, he raised up 12, 72, or however many? What if every, every time? Who's to say he wouldn't? Right? This is, again, the means, right? So God has his plan. The church is the means. And simply by asking is one of the means and God will do it. What if you may never meet the people? We may never know. But one day we'll get before the Lord and we'll have seen. We could have we could have sent out legions of laborers. Right? So this is one of the ways the church is called to engage the work is simply by asking the Lord. So one of the most powerful prayer ministries or missions ministry a church can have is by these two prayers. Your kingdom come on earth. Lord, and Lord, send up, send out more and more laborers. <clears throat> I've actually heard of small churches praying for unreached people groups and then God raising up a few families from their small churches to go and try to reach them. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, you could hear stories of, of Jim Elliott starting prayer chains for the nations in his college where he would have make sure it was like 15 or th I have to go back. I'm going to talk about this later in the course, but it was every 30 minutes or every 15 minutes, he would have people set up to ha have a time of prayer to pray for the nations. And it is incredible what God did through that prayer chain, right? So not only was Jim and his friends uh, martyred, which unleashed a revolution of missionaries, um, but you can actually go back. I'm, I'm going to have to get the numbers now. Um, but I think it was roughly around 500 of the alumni from that college were actually years later still on the field serving the Lord. And it was the most missions class that that school has ever had. Just some small little prayer chain, you know, that were it was, the prayers were probably pretty pathetic. But again, we're talking about the means that God uses to do this. What if every time you ask the Lord to do this, he did, and you just never saw the results? We're not guaranteed that God's going to raise up the family from our church. And it really doesn't matter, you know. Um, but we're to, by faith, do this, knowing that God's raising up somebody. God's answering this prayer. It's going to be effective. Okay, Um what are some other ways to have how we're to pray? We're to pray for those already laboring. So over and over in the New Testament, we see Paul and a bunch of other people saying, hey, pray for us, 
right? So um, 1 Thessalonians 5.25, brothers, pray for us, right? Um, um, 2 Thessalonians 3.5, finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. So one of ways that we're to, we're to accomplish the commission is simply by also praying for the people who are out there. They need, they need our prayers. Um, and that when we pray for them, the Lord helps them. And we're to pray for them, their well-being, for their spiritual well-being, and for God to, to bless the work of their hands, to open up doors and to advance the gospel. I'm telling you, if you can go through seasons of life and you can tell when people are praying for you and when people are not for sure. So we know this works. Um, so anyway, so prayer. So those are just a handful of ways that we're called to pray that the New Testament tells us. <clears throat> Second point, by preaching the true gospel. So the command to go and make disciples and to baptize is a command to go and preach the gospel. God has given only one message that can save all the nations, and that's the gospel. So if the church is going to fulfill the Great Commission, it must preach the true gospel. Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek Paul then, when he's writing Timothy, he says a really awesome, one of my favorite verses actually about the ch local church. Um, he says in 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 15, he says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So he's calling the church a pillar of and a buttress of the truth. And what do pillars and buttresses do? They uphold something. Right? So the church does not sit and get to say, this is what we think is true. This is not, you know, it's perceived it. It's been entrusted with it. And it's called to steward it. And it's the gospel. It's the word of God. Right? And, and you could read the rest of the letter and you'll see a first and second, or second Timothy, first Timothy. And you can see some of the ways that the church is to uphold it by, by guarding its purity. He sends Timothy there to, to silence the false teachers. It's amazing. There is always a truth war out there. You know, um, we may could preach the gospel at a place and plan a church even, but it's going to take a lot of continued teaching to make sure that the gospel is, the gospel is preserved and is truly being preached and taught. <clears throat> you know, because one thing you can bank on is that when you take the gospel to a place and it bears fruit, is that the enemy is going to come in and try to per pervert it and change it. So the church has received the gospel and is called to um, uphold its purity. So that's why doctrine matters. That's why truth matters. So we could even see a recently reached people group unreached in the next generation if we don't teach faithfully the Word of God. Again, this is why it takes a team effort. You know, that's why it's not, I'm just going there and starting a Bible study and then leaving. It takes a lot of instruction, a lot of raising up of other leaders. Truth, truth, truth. <coughs> because of what we talked about last week, sorry guys, <coughs> it's not so much about sending people, but it's about sending God's Word through people, right? And so the people we send need to have a right understanding of these things and, and to teach. <coughs> so the church must not only proclaim the gospel for people's conversion, but must further teach the gospel to believers and to continue their spiritual formation around the gospel. So we could, if we had time, we would talk about also how the church upholds the truth by living it out faithfully, right? And by continuing to, to proclaim it. But a lot of damage can be done and is done in the name of missions because of false gospels. I mean, we, we, where did the prosperity gospel come from? You know, why is it all around Africa so much? You know, why can we go into Latin America? I mean, I've been in Asia, Latin, Latin America, and easy believism is all over the place. 
Who brought it there? The Americans, primarily, right? And it's bringing a lot of damage, a lot of damage. It spreads. It's amazing how fast, you know, Paul told Timothy that these false teachers, their teachings spread like gangrene. It's amazing how fast false teaching spreads. So that's why it's very important that we preach the true gospel and continue to teach and preach it. Um, all righty. Let's talk about the next point. <coughs> Excuse me. I seem to get one good cough out. I've been trying to do these little coughs. Was it? <coughs> all righty. <coughs> So the third point is by planting biblical churches. We'll talk a lot about this because we talked about church planting being the goal of missions. Um, but the best way, the reason I highlighted under there, biblical churches, again, because we're not just, hey, let's start a, a little Bible study and then leave. I've seen a lot of guys say they started church planting movements. And I mean, <laughs> really what it was was just a bunch of little Bible studies. Right, and then coming back to America, saying they've planted you know hundreds of churches, you know praise God for those Bible studies, but you know and that's a great start in the process, but that's not where you, you have not arrived. There's still tons of of work to do there. Um, so um, again, we see church planting as the New Testament model of missions, um, churches being planted, and then churches planting other churches. Um, so the church, you know, is the hub where discipleship happens. It's where other leaders are trained and sent out and plant other churches. So the church fulfills the Great Commission by planting biblical churches that will then seek to plant other churches and continue the work of outreach to their community. It's amazing how Paul would say, all right, there's no more room for work for me here. Right? And he's talking about in Jerusalem. And then he's saying, I've fulfilled the work from Jerusalem to Illyricum. And Illyricum is like modern day Turkey. And he's talking about Jerusalem. I think it's from like here to Arizona. He's saying, no more room. No more room. And what's he saying? That every single person was reached? No. But he was saying, I've planted churches. These churches have got leaders now. Now it's their job to continue to make disciples and to reach their communities. Right? So there's enough work. I'm going to keep going where Christ has not been named. Um, so the ultimate goal is to see churches developed, um, and then be biblical, biblically sound and healthy. Um, we'll move on from there though. Number four, how the church, local church goes global is, um, by sending out your best. Um, it says now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, uh, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Um, could you imagine how hard it could have been for these handful full of leaders that there were to see Barnabas and Saul sent off. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wouldn't. But I could see in our day that being a very hard thing. I mean, you have Paul and Barnabas, these mighty men of God, who were doing great work in those churches. They were being used by God there. Then to just see them be sent off, I'm sure they could have still been used. You know, I've heard of, um, I think it was John Patton, that people tried to convince him to stay. Because like, hey, you got this inner city ministry thing going on. The Lord's using it. The Lord's using it. You should stay. And he said, no. You know, God's calling me elsewhere. Um, so if the church is going to, to see the Great Commission finished, then they must be willing to see some of their best members go. Um, so what type of people do we send out? You know, we'll talk about that later. But these are mature Christians who are gifted differently. But they all serve the purpose. All that can serve the purpose in some way of making disciples. Some of these are gifted in evangelism, others preaching and teachings, others maybe more in counseling or one-on-one -on -one scenarios or in, or in acts of service, but all are gifted in some way and can contribute to the mission at hand. So these are people that it'll, it doesn't matter whether they're gifted in preaching and teaching or if they're just a blessing, a family who's faithful. Um, if the church is going to see the, the Great Commission finished, we've got to be willing to let 
those who God calls go, and we'll, we'll see that it's some of our best people. But we've got to be willing to see that happen. Um, number five, by using your gifts to serve your local church. So when I say this, I'm not just talking about pastors and teachers. I'm talking about each member in the church. Again, we're talking about the local church, how God has called the local church to fulfill the Great Commission. And I'm saying one of the ways the Bible tells the church to do that is by each of its members in that local church seeking to just use their gifts and serve and build up the body. So that doesn't sound like anything special. You may say, man, I don't feel like I'm doing anything that's, that's profitable. But again, we, we, we said that mis- the local church is where missionaries are born and formed, right? In the best context of growth and, and prep, per, preparation for a person who's going to go do that is to be in a local church that's healthy. And it takes more than just good preaching to make a church healthy. That, that helps steer the ship, get the right way, go in the right place for sure. But it takes each member serving its purpose. You know, I know of a handful of missionaries who say that being at the cross church was the best thing that ever happened to them on the mission field because they got to see what a local church actually was like. You know, it, and they were blessed and they were formed. I mean, you may think, oh, I'm just, I will, you know, I don't preach and teach, but I mean, but who knows, you know, maybe it's encouragement or praying for people or laboring of love. I mean, you're helping Make disciples in the church by using your gifts and by loving the people of God. And God is called to use that gift to build up the church, right? And it brings the people of God up into maturity. And so it's very effective. I mean, look at, I'll just get the verse going. Romans, you know, Paul says in Romans 15, we'll get to that one in a second, but let's read 1 Corinthians. That I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. You know, I've, I've met with per, me in my life personally. There are so many people in the church who, who will never preach, who will never go out and, and travel or, or do whatever. But you know what they've done? They've blessed me and prayed for me and encouraged me. And I'm, I'll do that. Are you, so they're going to share in that work. I mean, I can't tell you how many families got to the point where they were actually able to go because it was a team effort of the church pouring into them, right? So the way you serve matters. Paul says to the church in Rome, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are all are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to instruct one another, right? So he's saying about this church, you're a healthy church. I'm happy, I'm happy with where you guys are at. You're all equipped with all goodness, and able to instruct one another, right? So how you serve your church affects the big picture. So your, your ministry in the church is vital to the discipleship of others, no matter what ways you serve. Your example, your encouragement, your carrying one another's burdens, your exhortations, your prayers, your love, your rebukes, your service is vital to the building up the body of Christ and to the spiritual formation of others. All right, let's talk about number six. By sacrificially loving others. So Christians are to be a people who are, who are known for their love, both for the lost and also for the body of Christ. Um, so the way a Christian loves both the body and both outsiders is a huge testimony um, to the gospel. You know, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So usually we don't think of just loving other Christians as being a powerful witness to the outsiders. But it is. Right? I mean, they don't have, the world does not have categories for this type of stuff. Right? Um, so the way we love the body is a powerful testimony to outsiders. Um, but also to the lost. It says, and when James and Cephas, this is Paul talking, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. 
Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eagle, eager to do. So they're saying, yes, take the gospel, go plant churches in the Gentiles, but hey, don't forget the poor, right? So usually, again, there's a pendulum that is swung. We want to be very clear and make sure that, you know, the church is not just, doesn't only, is the mission of the church is not just to fix every wrong in the world. It's not just to only help people with their physical suffering, right? We want to prioritize eternal suffering and their spiritual needs, right? Um, but God also calls us as believers to love people, right? So as, as Christians, we are called to love. And when we love people the way Christ loved us, that preaches a powerful sermon, right? Um, especially in the context of missions as well. I mean, love is to always be genuine. We're never just to say, well, if I love, the, if I do this, then I could share the gospel with them. I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a motive. We want the motive to be pure. Um, but usually, especially in, in, in other cultures, because that's what the Great Commission is, right? Planning churches and all people groups. Sometimes it's hard to be welcomed and for people to want to listen to you. So you just even see the wisdom in God and calling us to be a loving people. Because sometimes that, that breaks down barriers. Breaks down barriers. Um, I even could tell a personal story of this a little bit. I was in an area where I was the outsider. And it took, a, we'd go out to do evangelism. And for weeks we tried to share the, it was, it was a very rough neighborhood, you know. Um, and it, it was hard, you know. And I would try to get in conversations with people. And, um, you know, so me and my friend, we would do the only thing we knew to do from there is we just took grab the football. It was just like and we know a lot of these guys out here love sports, so we'd go throw the football, throw the football. And little by little, some of the men would come and, and want to get in there and throw football. And so we would just go out there and throw football with them and, or whatever. And, um, and then it turned into a still not sharing the gospel. A couple of the other guys who would come, they grew weary and stopped coming because they were like, we came out here to share the gospel and not play sports. You know, we're just like, well, you know, this is a long-term view, brother. We're not just trying to, you know... We actually want to love these people and um, see long-term work here. So anyways, and so no gospel conversation, you know. And then it was, hey, man, I need a, can, can you give me a ride somewhere? They're like, yeah, sure, we'll give you a ride. A couple, couple, couple rides, right, um, later. And then months later, you know, one of the, man, one of the gentlemen, who, again, I never shared the gospel with at this point, um, I you know, didn't think much of what I did for him or what we did, not just me. Um, but he was moving and came to church. He came to church the last day he was here. He said, I just wanted to come and say bye to you guys. And uh, actually came to church. And then we were like, took him out to get some, some lunch. We got to share the gospel with him. You know, and it was just an investing in him, you know. Um, so that's kind of what love can do sometimes. It's, you know, it it's... Sometimes we don't get to share the gospel ever, you know, but love is very important. Um, it's actually interesting. So there have been legitimate um, studies um, who, where they, they, you know, usually people are saying, you know, usually missionaries get put into categories, you know, um, where they say, oh, these people just only want to help people's physical needs. And then you have these people over here saying, we just want to preach, 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 you know. And in, in there's kind of a war going on and um, which one's right, which one's wrong. But it's very interesting. Legitimate sociologists have done studies that missionaries who were the most eternal, eternity-minded, meaning their number one priority was preaching and conversion, actually did the most earthly good. Um, that's actually a proven fact. So even the missionaries, so the missionaries who had the most eternal focus did the most lasting good. And you see missionaries throughout the ages have planted schools, taught people how to read, given clean water, and these are all good things that simply just opened up doors for more gospel witness. So sacrificial love, and I'm keeping it very broad because, I mean, different areas have different needs. Sacrificial love is a massive category, but is one of the ways that God has called us if we're going to see the Great Commission finished. One of the ways we see that happen is by sacrificially loving people. All right, my number seven, by being faithful in season and out of season. 
So, so one way the church sees the Great Commission finished is by having a long-term blood, sweat, and tears pushing through enduring mindset. Paul says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. He says to Timothy, Preach the word, in, be ready in season and out of season. Right, so Christian work is referred to as, as um, laboring. I mean, farm, agricultural lab- terms are used. S- war type um, language is used. Marathon running, extreme sports that take a lot of discipline is used. So, so if the church is going to, to see this done, it's going to take a long-term, multi-generation um, view. Right. Um, there have been missionaries who have spent their whole life in other areas of the world and have been faithful and saw no converts. Right, and, and sometimes it took multiple generations, but that's just what it's going to take. That's what it's going to take. And what's beautiful is that the Bible does not say that success is upon the numbers that are produced, but on faithfulness. So if the church wants to view how can we succeed in this, maybe not necessarily seeing in okay, what type of fruit are we going to produce in results? But just saying, let's just be faithful to the things that God has called us to do in season and out of season. Um, A lot of painful toil, um, but it's going to take um, a long-term strategy to see that done. Um, Oops, uh, there's another point. Point number eight got deleted. By giving financially. So not everybody is called to go. But everyone we saw is called to pray. Everybody's called to serve at their local church. Um, Everybody's called to give. This is one of those things people say, you know, you either go, give, pray, or disobey. Right? So so it takes money to do this work. And God blesses us all with a certain amount of finances. And we're to steward it well to see the gospel advanced. Um, John says, um, beloved, it is a faithful thing that you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So he's actually saying, hey, financially support these faithful brothers. And when you do, you become a fellow partner in their work. Um, so not everybody is called to go, but one of the ways the church will see it happen is by supporting the work being done financially. Paul in Romans says, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. So Paul's saying, hey, church in Spain, just wrote you this really awesome letter on the gospel. And maybe you could also, you know, send me on my way financially. So the labor is worthy of his wages. So this doesn't matter if, it, if it's cross-cultural, right, or indigenous. We're called to support financially those who are laboring um, and who are called to do the work. All righty, number nine, by training those called to go. So the church is God's plan, A, for the Great Commission. And back then, they didn't, in the early church, they did not have seminaries for Christians to go to. Um, what did they do? You know, not bashing seminaries. Um, is, you know, you have Paul telling Timothy, and what you have heard in, from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So this is very similar to point number five, where I was talking about how you you know, just a normal member of a church. Use your gifts. This is, this one's directed primarily to those in leadership, right? If the church is to see the Great Commission finished, then we must invest in people who are God's hand. I mean, look at the, he's saying faithful men. So that's, that's, that's the character um, who will be able to teach others also. That's the giftedness. So we see the people whose God's hand is on, we invest in them, right? We invest in their character, Again, this is character. This is theological formation. So 
the church is to be a place that invests in that invests in future leaders and is willing to see them go when God calls them. All right, we'll move on from that one. Let's go to ten, and um, last, well, second to last, by willing by being willing to suffer. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. So one of the ways that God calls the church to fulfill the Great Commission is by being willing to suffer. I mean, some areas more than others, some suffering different. But you're always away from home in another culture, learning another language. You know, there are different struggles in every place. But the principle is still there that if the church wants to see this done, she's got to be willing to suffer. Got to be willing to suffer. A lot of the places where the work still needs to be done, they don't want you to go there. You know, so it's going to take a lot of suffering. And I think that's why Jesus, he knew this. That's why he promised his presence to be with the church as she does this work. And also told them all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me, assuring them. This, things aren't as they seem, right? I'm over all. I'm sending you out as sheep as wolves. Sheep amongst wolves. Um, Alrighty, number 11. And at the end of the day, we must remember that it is God who ultimately builds His church. Acts 2, 4, 2, 47. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. So again, the church is the instrument. He's giving them the church means. He's saying, here's what the mission is. Go do this. Here's how you do it. And at the end of the day, I build my church. Take confidence in that. So we are his weak instruments. Um, and at the end of the day, our calling is not to produce results, but to be faithful in the labor. And God's the one who's going to build his church. Um, alrighty, well, we'll stop there. So that is the how. Those are some 10, 11 ways of how the church in Scripture is called. The local church is called to advance and, and fulfill the Great Commission. We'll see that some churches, it should be said, some churches will be gifted by the Spirit of God and have maybe greater strong points. But all should strive after these things. you know. And we, we could see the Great Commission finished in that way. All right, let's pray. Um, dear Father, we just thank you for blessing our time. We just pray, God, that you would help us to pray, to labor. And um, we just pray that you would just raise up a generation that's passionate about seeing uh, churches planted and your people built up. Lord, we pray you would add to your, your number of those who are being saved. In Jesus' name, amen.